Welcome to NLP Talks with Laura Evans, a podcast for people looking to unleash their potential in business and life. I'm Laura Evans, international trainer of NLP and host for this podcast series. Join me for insightful interviews with people that know firsthand just how NLP can change lives and they'll share with you tips and strategies to help you clear your path to success. Stay tuned. Hey, how you doing? It's Laura Evans here, founder and lead NLP trainer here at Unleash Your Potential and of course, your host for this podcast. It gives me great pleasure to bring you episode one of our brand new series. And to kick off series four, we have an interview with the hugely successful Rob Moore. Having written 16 books as a property guru, running multiple companies, turning over tens of millions of pounds, personal wealth in excess of 10 million, running the biggest property training company in the UK. He started his NLP journey over 50 15 years ago. After getting into personal development, he discovered NLP and in 2006 did both his practitioner and master practitioner course. In this episode, he's going to go deep on mindset, particularly talking about the difference between perception and reality, which you're going to love. He talks about how the fundamentals of NLP have helped him in all areas of his life. And we're also going to dispel one of the biggest myths of NLP. Um, I cannot wait for you to hear what he's got to say. So let's go across to the interview with Rob and discover how he first came across NLP. P.S. This episode contains the odd swear word, so if you've got little ears around, listener discretion is advised. I met my business partner, Mark Homer, um, at a property networking event right at the end of 05, around about that time. And I'd gone there because I was searching for something because I was struggling as an artist and my dad had just had a huge nervous breakdown and I was lost. And I didn't sell many paintings as an artist, but there was one gallery stroke designer furniture shop. Uh, It was really modern and my art was quite modern and and that sold the most of my work in Peterborough. And the owner, he was, was, I wouldn't say a mentor, but he he wanted me to do well. And I think he sensed that maybe something could happen soon, but I was a little lost. So he kept saying, Rob, you should get into property and um, Rob, you should come to these networking events. And I was just really scared and couldn't see how it would work for me. And then when my dad had this big nervous breakdown, and I guess I was just a bit stunned and lost even more. And I blamed myself for a lot of things in my life. I guess it was a realization my life was going nowhere. I said to Mike, obviously a lot of things happened in between, but I basically said to Mike, I'll give you the radio edit, not the album version. And Mike, Mike said, um, hey, look, we've got this property networking event coming up. It happens every month, this next week. Why don't you come? And of course, I declined it so many times, but this time I said, right, I'm doing it. And I was scared um, because I you know, wasn't social at all back then. And I met my business partner, Mark Homer, right at the end. He was the first um, He was the first person I followed up with afterwards because that's what you're told to do at networking events. Uh, and um, he was the last bo- person I spoke to at the bar. And he said, come to our offices. Come and meet me and my boss and um, read these books. They're great. And he gave me Think and Grow Rich. Napo- um, yeah, by Napoleon Hill, Richest Man in Babylon, and then I think Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think. And because I just had a really life-changing event just a week before or whatever, I read all three before I met them. Um, and I, I went and I met Mark and he took me up to the offices and I met his boss, Terry, who became my boss two months after. And Mark said, did you, did you um, read those books? And I like recited a load of stuff. I didn't know what any of it meant. I didn't know what do dad was, but I recited it. And Mark couldn't believe it. He, I, he, never, he didn't tell me this for years, but he said, I always used to give people books. It's like a bit of a test and no one would ever read them. And you read all three in a week. And within eight weeks, maybe of that day, I'd got a job there selling properties on the phone. And I'd never sold on the phone properties. I'd never done any of those three things, sold or on the phone or property. But again, I was like, I need to change my life. And so he gave me a job and I was going to work for free in the day for him and then carry on my painting at night because I was painting at random times anyway. And thankfully, just before I said, I'll come and work for free, he said, look, I'll pay you six quid an hour. I think it was, it wasn't much. It was six quid an hour, but I'll give you 500 commission on a sale. 
I was like, all right. And then I said to Mark, so how do you sell then? And he <laughs> gave me some audios to listen to. And, you know, because back then it was CDs. He'd give me some CDs to listen to and I'd listen to them all. And I progressed and started doing quite well. And Mark and my boss, Terry, were big into personal development. And as Terry could see that I was progressing quite well, he's like, I'm going to invest in you, Rob. You should go to this event. You should go. It started sending me on all these like discovery events or, you know, or some courses. He even gave me a... He gave me a company credit card after a few months and he said, look, you could, you know, if there's some courses you want to do, chuck it on the card. So we went to this course called Breakthrough to Success by Chris Howard, which was in 2006. And I went there and, you know, I was like, woo, yeah. You know, probably a bit happy, clappy, positive then, probably on the other. Yeah. Well, having been really negative and down and despondent and, um, you know, a victim, it was kind of a bit refreshing for a while to try and see positives. I realized actually you need both to be balanced now, but it, it served my journey. And I said to Mark, right, I'm buying these courses and went to lob the credit card. And he's like, you better phone Terry up first because I was going to buy them all, like 30 grand's worth. And he's like, I don't know. But, but Terry said, buy these courses. And he's like, yeah, but not all of them, Rob. <laughs> Um, and then, and so I, I um, registered for um, NLP Master Practitioner 1 and NLP Master Practitioner 2, got two for the price of one and a half. And I did those courses that summer. And that's how, so that's 15 years ago I did my NLP courses. I did, I sub, I sub, sub, subsequently done dozens, maybe even hundreds of courses. I'm a real big believer in self-education, but that's how it all started. Wow. That is some way of stumbling across NLP, right? Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so was it a property course you went on or was it just purely personal development, that course well, this, you went on? Yeah, this one, the, the, the sort of two-day rah-rah course, you know, that, that it was a, um, oh, where was it? Anyway, it was like 1,500 people in the room. Right. It was big. It'll, it'll come to me where it was in, the, in, in, a, in a moment. And... So I did the two-day sort of introductory course. And then from there, I signed up for NLP practitioner course and NLP master practitioner. I mean, that was when N the NLP movement was really big. I mean, the course names have changed and probably the content's changed. But, you know, a lot of Paul McKenna was obviously massive then. There was loads of people like Chris and T Chris, uh, Chris Howard and Tony Robbins and Topher Morrison and all these people doing NLP courses. Um, and I got a lot of benefit out of it. I, I, I think Chris taught it in a way that was applicable in your um, life in your business as a coach as a an entrepreneur and I mean really it got me on on this on the journey of mindset uh, and you know maybe controlling your thoughts feelings and emotions because mm. I think sometimes people think NLP is manipulation or it's tactics or gimmicks there's certainly tactical things you can do but I've, whilst I've tried all or most of those tactical things uh, and, and they can be very useful what stayed with me that whole time is trying to control the way you perceive situations. It was like perception versus reality. I learned on that NLP course. I didn't know the difference. Cause versus effect. I learned on that NLP course. And they're not gimmicks and tactics. They are fundamentals. And they were profound for me. I love it. I love it. So from your NLP training, because obviously, as, as you've quite rightly said, practitioner and master practitioner, like the two main levels uh, that most people will go through. What was the kind of the one thing you've mentioned a couple of things there, but going thinking back to 2006, I know it's a while ago, but what was the kind of lasting impression? What was that one thing that really stuck in your mind that you kind of think that's something I use consciously or unconsciously all the time? Uh, the, the single most profound shift I've ever had in my life. And it was either on this course or in that moment of time was understanding the difference between perception and reality. Um, and you've asked me the question, so I'm going to answer it. It might not be the most tactical answer, but I'm just being honest. Like back then, I used to think that my perception was the reality. I didn't know that there was a perception and a reality. I thought there was a reality and that reality was the world as I saw it. And I didn't understand that we all see the world through a different lens and filter and geography and economy and upbringing and culture and media. And once you understand the difference between perception being individual and maybe whilst you could argue there might be one overall reality, it's kind of not really relevant because all individuals are perceiving their own reality. Um, once you fundamentally understand that, it helps with empathy. Um, it helps with the fact that you can change your own reality by changing your own perception. So that one fundamental shift of the difference between perception and reality concertinaed so many more shifts. 
So um, I think one of the most profound things you can do in your own mindset is change your own perception to change your own reality, whether that is seeing upsides when you're down, um, whether that is changing the inner dialogue in your head, the self-talk, whether that is creating new pictures and images in your mind and um, using affirmations or, or visual images and managing stress and anxiety because you know stress and anxiety and fear are predicted and 99% inaccurate images or, or dialogue about the future. Um, and then, of course, guilt and shame and regret are one-sided perceptions, i.e. all downside, of the past. But as soon as you change what you see, your reality changes. So there's that really famous quote, which I love, which is, be the change you want to see. And people only change when your perception of them changes, unless they have a significant emotional event or they have a life change themselves. And so the difference between perception and reality, and it, it, it's not like something you learn and you're done. Like we're going to have problems every day. And the more we focus on the problem, we're, the more we're creating an Im imagined, fear-driven, irrational reality in our own mind. Our mind doesn't know the difference between perception and reality. Therefore, the perception that we create, which is illusion, an illusion, um, becomes our reality. A classic example, um, who here on this live stream and on this podcast has ever had an argument with someone in your head? That would be everyone. That would be everyone. Who's had that for hours? Who's read an email and got upset and angry? And who's played these scenarios over and over? Well, that is not real because that is not happening. But it's real to you. And your bodily functions can't understand it's not real because you'll get cortisol or stress or, or whatever. So it's so deep and profound understanding the difference between perception and reality. It was a wormhole that opened, that opens like the whole world. And for me, that was the biggest. That, that took me from being um, up until the age of 25, completely myopic about my view of the world to there being an infinite view of the world. Now, having an infi infinite view of the world also has downsides, Laura, sometimes a bit overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately, what that also teaches you is self-responsibility. Like you are responsible for everything in your life because your perception becomes your reality. So yeah, I mean, I could go on and on, but that's, that's the biggest shift I had. And it's massive. I know when um, I train out our master practitioner program and we have this exact conversation about the difference between your rea the reality and your perception of reality. And yet you act as if your perception is reality when, in fact, it's your distorted view of reality. It is your your view based on the deletions, distortions and generalizations that your mind makes. And yet we act as if it is like the gospel truth. And that gets us into so much hot water. And I, I'll never forget the look on people's faces where we have a discussion about what actually is reality. And actually, reality isn't what people think it is. Um, uh, and it, it's phenomenal. And, and that this whole discussion, as you say, about that perception is, is just phenomenal. Um, can, I, can I ask you then, so going on from that personal realisation that you had, when you then consider the success, I mean, there's no question, the phenomenal success that you have had in your businesses um, and in your life, what kind of hurdles did you personally face that perhaps NLP helped you overcome um, in terms of helping you to become the success that you are? I think I probably first learned about being a visual person through NLP back when I was taught, and look, don't forget, I was taught 15 years ago. So it might be like talking about CSEs instead of GCSEs. <laughs> we, learned, we learned the models of the world through visual auditory, kinesthetic and auditory digital. We still teach them, don't worry, that's still coming. Great. Great. <laughs> and, uh, and I was very high visual. I, well, I still am very high visual. So that helped me understand how I perceived and viewed the world. Um, and, you know, therefore how I related to it and what might motivate and inspire me or help me get my results or understand communication methods. And then, of course, in leading and training and speaking and selling, understanding people's different modalities, visual auditory, kinesthetic, auditory, digital, and whether you need to give them data and stats and facts or you may need to make them feel something or you need to show them with, with visual imagery. That obviously helped with hiring staff, 
Um, it helped with sales. It helped with marketing. It helped with with leadership. So that was definitely a um, a practical tool that that I used. Of course, um, I first learned in NLP the power of body language over words. So I think when I learned, I think words were seven percent ish. I think tone was I don't know. It was twenty thirty eight. 38. Yeah. 38. And then body language was more than 50. 55. Right? There you go. So um, understanding nonverbal communication was huge and, you know, and, and maybe reading people and, you know, fresh out of the NLP courses, I was trying to read everyone like an FBI agent <laughs> or what, where's their eye movements and you know, have, have they got a reversed um, perception in their brain. So actually up right is up left. And there was all this, and it was fun. It was fun. There were some games and I did some um, collapsing anchors and all this kind of um, uh, visual anchors and stacking anchors and all this kind of stuff that was fun and having the, um, you know, the, the power anchor on your body, like pressing. Anchor, yeah. yeah. And getting yourself in an emotional state. And that was all cool. And it, and, um, and I was practicing what I learned. Um, but ultimately it's usually the fundamentals and the foundational stuff that um, you can apply across all areas of your life. Um, and then, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur like I am or a leader, or if you want to be a salesperson, or if you want to be a great parent, you know, the, the nonverbal communication is vital. If you want to do a podcast, then of course your tone is really important. And anyone that follow, follows me now, I'm pretty energetic and enthusiastic with my tone uh, and, and using my tonality to speak and not just relying on the words. Um, and then, you know, in a um, face-to-face situation, again, using um, body language. I mean, I, I probably used to do the matching and mirroring a bit more strategically when I just learned it. Um, but now I'm just trying to become aware of, um, you know, rapport. And, and you know, rapport is is really vital. And, of course, when you learn in NLP, it, it can be quite scientific, the way that you learn rapport. Um, and, you know, ultimately creating common ground and making someone feel comfortable. Uh, and connecting with them as they see the world, not as you see the world. You, all that stuff has stuck with it. It's really interesting, Laura, to talk about this because it's all coming back. And this was, <laughs> you know, some people say, oh, what's the point of doing a course? You never remember much of it. And, you know, most people don't implement any of it. You, like, you're testing me on stuff I learned 50. I can remember the colors of the folders. So it was green and blue green for um, practitioner and blue for masters, I think. Said um, like a visual person, like a pro. There you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, it's amazing that that stuck with me. I mean, those courses were only a couple of grand each and it's still to this day, 15 years later, getting benefit from them. That's got to be a great thing. So anyone that doesn't see the benefit in investing in themselves and, you know, I think it might have been Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar or one of the forefathers of personal development said, working, well, let me get this right, Yeah, education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. Um, And I believe that traditional education might take you into a career, but investing in yourself. And and the the good thing about NLP is it's just really, it's pretty, um, you can use it in a lot of disciplines, friendships, partnerships, relationship, business, sales, marketing. You can use the language in your sales copy, can't you? You can use... I mean, even though words are only 7%, you can use visual and auditory and kinesthetic language in your sales copy, for example. Let's see what I mean. I love it. It's literally like talking to you. It's like all of a sudden an NLP practitioner kind of manual has exploded in front of you and all these words are coming back. Um, So um, a number of our community are parents. Um, and although I don't have kids myself, obviously we know your two beautiful children. I loved the live the other day, by the way, it was awesome with in the car with you cheeky as ever. And I loved it. Have you ever found, um, some of these NLP skills, um, have been of use to you in your personal life? Um, you know, in terms of the way that you interact with the kids or, or, you know, and if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. But I'm just curious because I know it's easy for you and I to sit here and talk business and business results, but I'm also curious about the impact it had for you personally and whether you've got anything in that area. Yeah, I think understanding how someone's model or view of the world is, I think that is a powerful thing because one, it creates empathy. And I think one of the best ways to relate to human beings is through empathy. Two, if you then want to lead them, because let's be honest, a parent is a leader. If you want to lead them, um, trying to lead them through your model of the world, which is different, is going to cause friction. Trying to lead them through their model of the world 
um, is going to have less friction because you're create you're you're matching their perception of the world and then trying to lead them into yours because you know there's certain values you want to instill in your children there's certain things that you are responsible for your children that you ultimately have to this we're going to do this and we're not going to do this and they the, you set the boundaries etc. So whether it's understanding their values now I didn't learn values from Chris Howard and my NLP courses I learned it from John Dr John Demartini. But I actually think values content in um, NLP courses would be really good. And why, why does um, why can't anyone hybridize their own course? So when we do our property investing courses, just to let you know, Laura, uh, on day three, we do a negotiation section because negotiating for property deals is a big part of it. And we have um, about a two or three hour section, on, which is based on NLP, um, you know, or VAKAD and understanding people's modalities and, you know, and, and um, communication and rapport and leadership and meeting someone where they're at and then leading them from there. So my children's values, the modalities of the world, are they visual, auditory, kinesthetic, auditory, digital? What's most important to them and selling to them what I want them to do based on their modalities and their values. And I believe it's not easy to do, but nothing worth it is. But probably the best thing you can do to lead or to get someone to do what you want them to do or motivate or inspire or get someone to take action is to get to their model of the world as quick as you can, find out what that is, and then um, sell what you want them to do based on their modality. Or, you know, like, are also training ground as far as I'm concerned for that because mm. they give it you as it is you get an instant result they either are or aren't going to do what you would like them to do um which is um yeah I just think it's amazing uh, amazing training ground now I'd like to move on to talk about something a little bit different which is in the title of our podcast which is um about dispelling some myths now over the years as you and I will both know there have been various different myths about NLP, um, uh, maybe perhaps misconceptions that some people have about uh, what it is and what it offers. So I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously, I've got quite a few in my head, but for you, what are some of those misconceptions or myths that to you are just plain wrong that you've heard out there about NLP? Well, there's only really one, and that's NLP is manipulation. And everything cascades from there, you know, that's NLP sales tactics. Um, really, that's the that the overarching myth for me that then cascades down to all the other myths. Now, the reason I believe that, that is a myth and that NLP isn't manipulation and that um, NLP sales tactics are wrong is because that's an individual's view of NLP. Therefore, that's their perception, but it's not the reality. So that would be one thing. The next thing is anything can be manipulation or anything can be influenced. It's about the, the values and morals and ethics and goals and outcomes upon which it's used. So that's really the question. Uh, and of course, values and morals and ethics and goals and judgments, what are they? Individual perceptions, not you know factions or um, groups or movements or, um, or wide-held beliefs. They're individual perceptions. So usually when someone says, oh, that's manipulation, that's NLP sales tactics, that's bringing up some of their own perceptions about selling and speaking from the stage uh, and hypnosis and influence and probably triggering some of their own past. And so they're projecting out their perception, which they've assumed is the, is the reality, when in reality, it's just one perception. Now, uh, you can take a gun. Sorry, you can take 20 pounds and you can buy 20 bullets for a gun and you can shoot 20 innocent kids in a school. Or you can take 20 pounds and feed probably 100 people in the developing world for a week. So the money, the tool is not what holds the value. It's amoral. It's nothing. It's just the vehicle. So the NLP tool, the influence tool is just the vehicle. It's the individual and the perceptions of. So, I mean, NLP is not the only program out there that teaches influence. I mean, Robert Cialdini, who's a, a scientist, most marketers will, many marketers, will cite Robert Cialdini in their reading material as someone who is really well studied and has written some great work on influencing behaviors. So social proof, commitment and consistency, liking, there's authority. I think that he says there are six main ones. Um, and then he wrote uh, a, a follow-up later called Presuasion, 
which is the persuasion before the persuasion. Um, and all of those could be used to change someone's lives and they could be used to con someone. And Darren Brown, you know, he obviously uses NLP as well as many other um, techniques. And he, he's done things where he's got people to jump off a building. And of course, it's ended up being a fix or whatever. So all tools can be used for good. All tools can be used for manipulation, depending on A, the, the values, ethics, and morals of the individual using them, but then B, the perception of the individual judging them. And, and I agree. I think, you know, people often will say that to me. And it's the, like you say, it's the most common uh, myth around NLP is this manipulation. And I remember having this discussion once with someone else. And I said, but if you're going to say NLP is manipulation, by definition, all communication is manipulation. Yeah, like, argument, debate, trying to, me trying to get you to um, change your mind, me asking you to do something, everything. I mean, most people are trying to control everyone and most people are trying to get everyone to do what they want them to do. So you're absolutely right. So everything you try and do, therefore, is manipulation. Yeah, yeah. It's the same. You know, I use the analogy of a hammer. You can buy a hammer and you can smash glass with it or you could buy a hammer and use it to bash a nail in. Now, we don't stop having hammers because it has a benefit to it and people use it productively and helpfully to achieve an outcome. Um, It doesn't mean to say that we stop selling them because we've got concern that one person might smash a window in with it. Yeah, um, I think this raises a moral dilemma, which is worth thinking about. How hard would you manipulate someone to change their life? So I know my podcasts, my book, my courses, and lots of other material, my supporter program, the value I have on my stars program. You know, you know you, you're a part of some of these programs, value, uh, uh, Laura, you know the value. So um, how much would I push? How much would I use these tools and techniques? Because I've definitely been in situations where I've gone, oh, I don't want anyone to think I'm manipulating or pushing too hard. I'll be softly, softly, and I'm seeing them going by other courses and then going bust a year or two later or the trainer going bust a year or two later. So the moral dilemma becomes, you know, how, how hard would you push to get the sale or to get the decision or the action based on the result that it could give them? And um, I've been soft in the past on that and seen other people win and other people lose. And I feel like I do have some moral obligation to sell myself well. And, you know, because if people don't know me, you know, and by the way, selling myself well doesn't mean bragging. It doesn't mean hit, ooh, you're under by my ship. It means I, ha- I believe in what I do. I really believe in what I do. I believe in my vision and mission. Therefore, if I don't in some way give it a good go at trying to persuade you or guide you towards my material, maybe I've disserved you. And it is. I, th- I think you're right. I think it comes down to intent, you know, and I, and I want to run the sales courses that I run. I say to, you know, the word sales comes from the word sellio, which means to serve. If you don't go out there and ensure that people are adequately informed on what you have to offer, I agree with you. I've seen people like you have go off and buy something off someone else. And you're like, what have you done? Like, I know that what I was talking to you about would add huge value, would transform your life, would make a difference to your business, your career. And then you kick yourself because you're kind of like, I didn't do a good enough job of explaining the value and all of those things. Um, And it's, yeah, it's so frustrating but i think people um and you probably would have covered this on your 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 training but this away from value people particularly in a sales context people are so terrified about being seen as that dodgy car salesman and i'm sorry for the car salesman's watching but that image that people have in their heads they're so terrified of being that person that they don't even get out the starting blocks because they don't go that far and and it, it's just a wasted opportunity because of this perception in this case manipulation people go oh but I, I can't afford to be seen like that mm. uh, and it's, it's just so frustrating to, to see people miss out yeah and I think if you know that your products and services have fair exchange then there's nothing wrong with in a balanced fashion trying to persuade people that they will help them understanding their values making sure you sell the right things to the right people if you ever get a real sense this is completely wrong for them, then obviously, you know, maybe it's not your niche or whatever, then that might be a bit of useful feedback. But like you said, sales is service. And the world doesn't move unless we sell something. And we're all interdependent. And because we agreed that our universal exchange of value would be money, let's call it cash, but of course, there's non-cash money. Because we agreed that, we have created a transaction environment, a fair exchange environment, where I need to give you money 
in exchange for your products or services. But you need to show me what the value is because I need to, I need fair exchange, which means if what you're selling is worth a tenner, I'm going to pay a tenner for it. Um, but if I don't know, the element of competition in a market means that um, I'm competing with you to prove that I can give you more value for a tenner. So if you don't prove the value you give for your tenner, someone else is getting that tenner and you lose out. So yes, sales is service, but you've got to prove your value in, in the, the economics landscape uh, in a market which has uh, forces such as fair exchange and competition. Yeah, no, absolutely. Another myth I'd like your take on, I know you said that main one, and I agree, that one is the most common myth. The other one that um, I get a lot and my students get a lot is that NLP doesn't work on me um, and it won't work. I, I, obviously, I've got a take on it, but I'd love your take on, um, you know, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think there's anything on the planet that works on everyone. And I'm a big believer that people usually won't change, certainly in the short term, unless they want to. So, you know, if, if we did another episode in 10 years, Laura, might I have changed? Well, I'll be 51 and it's likely that I would have because I'd have evol- evolved into a different decade. But if I, want to, if I want to change quickly or if I want to make impactful, fast and lasting change, I've got to want to change. So what I've decided to do in my marketing is help the most the people who want to change. And anyone who doesn't want to change and is sitting there going, you can't hypnotize me and I'm not going to fall for your NLP tactics. Well, no, it's not going to work and I'm not going to fucking try. What's the point? And what have I got to prove? I've got nothing to prove. So uh, that's my take. I don't think anything works on everyone. I'm sure there are some people that are more um, prone to hypnosis than others, more suggestible, I think, is the word you use in um, hypnosis, for example. And that's okay. I think if you really want to change things that you do with your coach, your mentor, your NLP trainer, your practitioner, and your therapist will likely work or could work. If you really don't want to change, they could be Darren Brown. And Darren Brown ain't going to hypnotize, hypnotize you if you don't want to play. That's my take, anyway. Yeah, totally. And, I, and I've and i used that. I was talking to some guys on the course just last week about, you know, I, I, I'm past that point of where people say, oh, but you can't do this to me um, and this won't work. And I'm just like, yeah, and if that's the decision you've made, you are absolutely right. Um, yeah. And I'm like, right, come on, where's the next person that wants to change? You know, I'm always yeah. very quick to tell people NLP is not a magic wand. I don't think any kind of personal development, professional development is a magic wand. All right, there's inside tracks, there's formulas, there's things you can learn, but there isn't a magic wand. We're not like on the matrix saying, do you want the blue pill or the red pill? You choose, um, and then you just take it and it's all going to mac- miraculously change. And I think you you have to learn uh, to, to, as you say, educate yourself, to want to change, to be willing to take those leaps to move forward um and yeah i completely completely agree now i'd like to ask you a couple of questions from my community if that's okay um so they they have submitted some questions um uh, which i'd like i'd like your take on um so the first one um is from chris Ryder, who was gentleman that did your course um uh back in 2013 um so here's the question so rob often talks of the importance of mindset what is the single most important skill to develop? I would say this is hard. People always ask me the one thing and, you know, there's multiple things. I believe that if you take time to discover your personal vision and mission and your values and how they link to your vision and mission, I believe that's probably the single most empowering thing you could do in your life. Because I believe that most, if not all things, cascade down from there. So um, if someone has a job and they're getting paid and they really don't want to do it and they're really not passionate about it and they're really not enthusiastic about it and it's low on their priority, they will procrastinate. They will get frustrated. They will um, basically these downside feelings are more infinite wisdom within us, giving us feedback through our emotions that we are out of balance and you know, we are not living according to what's most important to us. So on my journey of the last 15 years, which is the post-personal development era of my life, because up to 25 was the pre-personal development era, I probably articulated this about five years ago, Laura, but I was searching for a few years and I was on my way. 
But my personal vision is to help as many people on the planet start and scale their business and get a better financial education. And then my foundation's vision adds on to the end of that, especially young and underprivileged entrepreneurs. And, on, and to me, an entrepreneur is someone who wants to solve a problem, you know, someone who wants to create a meaningful product or service. And by the way, you can be an entrepreneur in a company that's called an intrapreneur. So, but I'm just clear. And that's my vision. And when I think about that, that inspires me. When I get distracted, that refocuses me. When I get frustrated, that energizes me. Uh, and that really um, is the foundation of everything that I do in my career and then cascading into my personal life. And then your values, i.e. what's most important to you in your life. It might be family, wealth creation or money and health and fitness. For example, they might be your top three. Um, and knowing what they are, and in my book, Life Leverage, I go through a way to, for you to find out what your values are. It, a fairly succinct process. Um, someone I've learned a lot from, John Martini, he has a much deeper dive process. But mine's just pretty short and snappy. When you live according to your highest values, i.e. what's most important to you in your life, and you become consciously aware of it, then conflicts remove and frustration and procrastination and overwhelm and distraction and susceptibility to get rich quick and looking for short-term fixes and beating yourself up. And all of these dissolve and you go into balance. Also, you can get over-emotional as well. You can be infatuated or you can look for really quick win highs or live in fantasies. So once you've discovered those two things, I think that that um, is the foundation upon which you can have a good balanced mindset. I think overly up or overly down, overly high or overly low, overly positive, overly negative. I think that those are dangerous extremes. And um, I think many people have gone through that journey. I was overly low uh, before 2005. I was a bit rah, rah, overly high and deluded in 2006, 7, 8 maybe. But I was just trying to come out of my hole. So it's part of my journey. But, um, you know, I think there's an upside and downside in absolutely everything if we search for it. And I think wisdom is understanding the simultaneous polarized upsides and downsides of any situation. Um, and, you know, the things that are highest on your values, you will endure challenge as well as pursue pain and uh, pleasure and support. So the things that, you, that aren't important to you, as soon as you get a challenge, you go, oh, bollocks to this. Oh, I don't want to do it. I'm giving up. I'm no good at it. But if it's meaningful and inspired and something that's most important in your life, you will endure all sorts of challenge to grow through it. Um, so it's often a good tester. What's a good tester of are you living a life according to your highest values and in, a, an inspired life? that's meaningful to you, how much will you enjoy the challenges? Oh, yes. One of the reasons why a number of us go self-employed, right? Yeah, yeah. I work harder now than I've ever worked, but I love every minute of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Thank you. That's awesome. Awesome answer. Uh, right, next question. How do you mean, uh, so how does he maintain his sense of balance and manage his mindset between being wealthy and simply being happy? So this was from Louise. Honestly, not that well. Not that well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on the outside, it may look like I've got the accolades of a massive podcast and what is it, six, 15, 16 books, 17, 18, 19, I'm writing at the moment, tens of millions of pounds worth of property and big companies that eight higher, you know, eight figures plus, blah, blah, blah. They're just facts. I'm not bragging because um, I am a bit of a workaholic and that tends to be my default. And it tends to be my distraction from real pain in my life. And I tend to obsess on things, especially um, either things I'm really into or new things I get into. So I don't know that I have a, 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 an ideal balanced life. I, I don't know that I know anyone that does. If I'm honest, I don't can't think of anyone who's who I go. You know what? You've got ideal balance. I think also what is ideal balance? Well, it's ideal according to you, and it's in the areas that are most important to you in your life. So, if spirituality is not important to you, then why do you need to spend one seventh of your time on it? If you don't have a family, you know, and you're single, then why do you need to spend one seventh of your time on that? If you're already pretty fit and you don't, you know, don't need, to, why do you need to spend one seventh of your time on that? You know, there might be about seven areas of your life if you've already got a lot of money or if you love your, your job. So you've got to think about what's most important to me in my life and spend your time on those areas and then delegate, delay, or delete everything else. So with me, I, I am going through a bit of a, a phase or a change where I'm just trying not to be so obsessive about entrepreneurship. Um, I do content every single day, as you know, Laura, sometimes three times a day. This will be my 
third piece of content. I can't keep up with you, Rob. There's so much content. (laughs) Um, And there's always a cost where I I think it might have been, again, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn. uh, Forgive me if I've attributed the wrong person to this quote, but um, where focus goes, energy flows and results show. And so I've manifested results in areas I've focused and I've manifested non-results or voids or pain in areas I've not focused. So someone asked me yesterday on a podcast, look, Rob, what, what, what's the future for you? Well, I've got companies that do tens of millions of pounds. I've got a property portfolio of hundreds of units, and they can pretty much take care of themselves with my strategic involvement. So I should define what that strategic involvement is. I should bring, I mean, we had, we had 95 staff in one building before the lockdown. So it's not like I haven't got anyone to help me. That's not including all of our outsourcers and researchers. I mean, that could be 150 plus, who knows? So um, constantly evaluating what's most important to you in your life and looking at where your energy is flowing and results are showing and then looking at maybe where they aren't and where you want to um, increase your results. But you can't naturally simultaneously balance your life. You can't do wealth creation, meditation, time with family, working on your mission, health and fitness. You can't do those all at the same time, simultaneously. It's impossible. What you can do is compartmentalize your day or compartmentalize your week. So I wrote a book called Routine Equals Results to help people do this, whereby in your routine, your daily routine or your weekly routine, you can spend pockets of time focused and isolated from distractions and present in that moment on key areas of your life health, wealth, happiness, you know, personal life, social, um, relationship, et cetera. So I tend to go through cycles and phases, um, which everyone does, but I tend to go through them fast (laughs) Um, and in an exaggerated, addictive, obsessive way where I will dive so heavily into something, I'll get results quick, but then there'll be a cost quick. Am I prepared to take that cost? Now, I'm quite prepared to take the cost of not being good at yoga because I'm not interested in it. But um, it's very easy when you're an entrepreneur to, I wouldn't say hide behind your accolades, but your accolades can define you. Millions of downloads, tens or hundreds of millions of pounds, dozens of books, you know, 500,000 people on your database, um, biggest property training company in the UK, huge online social media communities, all these tools and features on Facebook before anybody else in the world, supporters, stars, Facebook paid live events. Yeah, yeah, tick, 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 tick. Here's the thing. None of those are who I am. They are what I've done. And if I make what I've done who I am, then I will always be chasing something and I will never be fully satisfied or present in who I am because there's always someone who's got more downloads, more money, more podcasts. Every single one of those I I said, a specialist who's gone deeper and longer than me will have more manifested results. And my therapist has been saying to me for a long time, Rob, you, you know, what you do and who you are are not the same thing. And you need to detach those two and not let what you do define who you are and tune into who you are. Um, and I would say, you know, she's been saying, you know, that you're a kind person, a good person, um, that you're this and that. And I would say, yeah, I'm a good person because, and then I'd cite the 200 calls I've, one-to-one calls I've done over two weeks for people who are struggling or for supporters or people who gave stars and, you know, all the messages I replied to and all the time I'd done it. She goes, oh, no, 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 Rob, stop, stop. You are saying to me again by default that you're a good person because you did 200 calls to help people. No, 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 no. You are a good person anyway. Um, you are a kind person anyway. You are a, a, a worthy person anyway. You are a person worthy of love anyway. Um, and look, I won't go into the baggage of that. You've heard me do some of these supporters rants, Laura, about my um, upbringing and everything, but I'm trying to get more balance in my personal life about who I am as a person outside of being defined by an entrepreneur or my accolades. Um, whereas maybe for certain periods of time, I've done the opposite. So the second part of her question was not only that the wealth and the accolades, which obviously, like, like you say, you could sit here and rattle them off for a whole hour and you'd there'd still be more. But the simply being happy bit, where does Rob Moore sit on the simply being happy bit? Confused. And here's why. Can you simply be happy? Or yeah. is that something that you sacrifice for the accolades and the wealth that you create? So, look, we should do a simply being happy podcast. There could be an hour on this. So maybe let's just about end on this. I'll try and um, I'll try and articulate it into a short statement. So I think 
to simply be happy would assume that the purpose of life is happiness. None of my research has come up with the fact that the purpose of life is happiness. The purpose of life is to find your purpose. That seems maybe more credible. The purpose of life is to evolve because humanity, if, it, if we evolve, we survive. If we don't, we die out. It seems that if there's no use for anything in humanity anymore, whether it's the appendix or a species, it seems they die out. So, so this, maybe the purpose is evolution. That seems a credible argument. But happiness, think about what happiness is. Happiness is the reward for experiencing something. That's what it is. Because our emotions are feedback to our environment. If there was no environment, we had no sensory perception and there was no environment, we'd have nothing to react to. But our emotions react to our environment to essentially feedback to us whether it's a threat or a reward. So the rewards are ultimately in overcoming the challenge. I'll give you an example of why I believe this to be true. I bet you everyone listening and watching I've had the most deep sense of satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, elation, whatever, immediately after you did one of the hardest things in your life. I remember I was absolutely shit scared of those vertical slides. And I would spend months sitting at the top of them. I remember when I finally went down, the elated feeling. When I got the world record for doing 47 and a half hours straight public speaking, the, the feeling after was elation. And I don't believe you get elation from something small or easy. So now I need to open another loop. You've got to define happiness. If, I believe happiness is a reward emotion. It's a reaction to your environment to um, give you a benefit for um, enduring stress and pain because you can't be in that all the time. Otherwise, the stress kills you. But you then got to say, well, what does happiness mean? Well, there's, I think there's joy, elation, arousal, satisfaction, contentment, fulfillment. There's a scale of one to 10 on joy, satisfaction, arousal, contentment, fulfillment, compassion, empathy. And, and actually, if we sat down and brainstormed it, I bet you, you could find 30 or 40 different words, which are a different form of happiness. And then you've got a zero to 10 or zero to 100 scale of them. And I believe that's the case because the reward is equal to the challenge. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. It's also equal to value. So I believe that um, we get really really big feedback in the form of fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness when we help others. Now, if I helped an old lady cross the road, that's going to feel good. I'm going to feel good for 10 minutes. If I save someone's life, I'm going to be um, overcome with tears and I'm going to feel good for weeks, months or years. So the answer to the question is um, there is no such thing as perennial happiness and, and happiness is not the outcome. It's the reward. It's not the purpose of life. It's part of a and it's a one-sided part of a, du a duality equation because you have to have an opposite and the opposite is sadness. And the higher the elation you want to or you are going to experience, the higher the depression you're also going to experience to put you back into balance. So many of my mentors or the people I study say that the purpose of life isn't happiness. The only two transcending emotions are gratitude and love. They fill your heart. Happiness doesn't. Now, I think where the question comes from, though, is, you know, are you ever content? Do you feel reward for yourself? Can you feel good without your accolades? And I've found that hard because I have allowed entrepreneurship to define me because that is my greatest passion. And so what a journey I'm on right now, I am at a bit of a crossroads, but I always reinvent and redesign my life every six months, 12 months, 18 months anyway. So anyone who's followed me for long enough know that I'm just doing this. I think that's good practice. You know, life oscillates from chaos to order, to chaos to order, to chaos to order. So where I am right now is seeking to find intrinsic, not extrinsic, but um, once I find that, I'll probably be frustrated that I'm not achieving something and I want to go out on a new mission. Um, and, but I think the intrinsic happiness comes from self-love and living according to your highest values and accepting who you are. And that's hard when we are so surrounded by media and other people all trying to inject their values upon us. And I think when you subordinate to other people's values, that's when you're going to feel this lack of and therefore you want ex extrinsic things to make you happy to prove. Whereas I think when you are able to connect into who you are intrinsically without distractions, that's when I think you're going to have a, a deeper sense of fulfillment or joy or... I'll give you another example. People say to me, yeah, but Rob, Buddhas, they're happy all the time. They did 50 fucking years meditating. How much hard work is that? They didn't... They, how much hard work is... I, I, I follow the Dalai Lama. I think he's brilliant. And he's all about compassion. And he put a post a week ago saying, I've been meditating on compassion for 50 years. 
Well, there you go. So all happiness is hard work and reward. Even the Buddhists who experience the most happiness. Anyway, I could run on about this for ages. I, I was going to say, we, you could go on and on. I'm like, this is a whole other podcast episode. Yeah, it is. Sorry. But no, no, not at all. Not at all. I thank you so much for being so generous with your time today um, and sharing your NLP journey and the impact it's had for you personally um, and also in your business. I know my community will absolutely love it. For those of you that oh, most people of my students have heard me talk about you because they all know I'm in your mastermind and I've had one-to-ones with you and all that stuff. But guys, if you go and check out the, uh, the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast, you'll be able to find Rob and all his amazing podcast episodes. So, Rob, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on your show. 